Well, if you have your Bibles this morning, I invite you to take them and go with me to the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 3. Mark, chapter number 3. And as I stand here in front of you this morning, I look out and I see a whole lot more green than I would normally see on a Sunday morning. I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure why. I'm, of course, am being a little facetious. Uh, I am not wearing green today, but if you want to give me some corned beef, I'll take it. <laughs> I will take it in abundance. You can, I can assure you of that. That will not go to waste in my house. So we're glad that you're here today. God's given us a beautiful day, and uh, we're grateful for it. Uh, we have been fortunate this winter here in Northeast Ohio. It has been cold some here and there, uh, but uh, I, I probably shouldn't say this. I guess this is a knock on wood moment, but... Uh, the snow has uh, not been as bad as maybe what we're used to, and now that I've said that, we're all in trouble. Easter Sunday, there will probably be 10 inches of snow on the ground, uh, but uh, anyways, we're glad that you're here today, and uh, we are in a, in a series here on the Gospel of Mark, and uh, we, I think this is our seventh message, maybe the eighth message, and we're only into chapter number three. I think that's a harbinger of things to come, uh, but uh, we'll get through it one way or another. If you found your place and you're physically able to, we'd invite you to stand for the reading of the scriptures. Mark chapter number three is where we'll begin, and we'll read down through verse number eight, and chapter, chapter three and verse number one, down through verse number eight, where the Bible says, And he entered again into the synagogue. And there was a man there which had a withered hand, and they watched him, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, Stand forth. And he saith unto them, Is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days, or to do evil? to save life or to kill. But they held their peace. And when he had looked around about upon them with anger, grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he saith unto the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it out. His hand was restored, whole as the other. And the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea, and from Jerusalem, and from Idumea, and from beyond Jordan, and they about Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they had heard what great things he did, came unto him. I'd like to preach to you a message that I've entitled this morning, Three Types of People. I think we find three types of people here in this passage of Scripture. We find the Pharisees, and they represent a certain type of people. We find the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to look a little bit more and go a little bit further in this chapter than any we read, and they represent a certain type of person. And then we find these followers or this great multitude, and I believe they too represent types of people. And it's very possible, even in this room this morning, all three types of people are here. It's entirely possible. And I want you to consider and ask yourself the question, which type am I? Let's pray together. Father, again, we ask for your blessing upon the reading of your word and upon this message. Lord, would you fill us with your Holy Spirit's power, how we need you these next few moments. Lord, as we've often thought and are reminded of, I can preach a message and it falls on the ears of the listener. Lord, you can take what I say and you can take it to the very heart of the listener. And Lord, may we come into this room this morning and may the message not just fall upon our ears, but may it find its way deep into our soul. And only the power of the Holy Spirit can produce that. We pray that you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I think most of us are aware that this world is filled with people. I spent just a few moments gathering some statistical information and of course, all of this is changing on a daily basis, but I'm told that the population of the world today is currently 7 billion 600 million strong. I'll let that sink in for just a moment. The most populated country in the world has been most of my lifetime is the country of China. In China, you'll find 1 billion 382 million 300,000 souls. For comparison's sake, for comparison's sake, the nation of China in population has more than a billion more people than the United States of America. Now think about that for a minute. It's a massive, massive group of people. The most populated metropolitan area in our world is not Cleveland, Ohio, much to maybe your surprise. 
but it's actually the city of Tokyo, Japan, where in the metropolitan area of Tokyo, you'll find 35,676,000 souls. I'm glad I live in Cleveland, aren't you? I love Cleveland, by the way, you know? It's cheaper here, not much traffic here. It's a great place to live, so I think I ought to be hired by the Chamber of Commerce. What do you think? <laughs> Did you know that the world, the world reached one billion in population. It took, it took until the year 1804. So prior to 1804, going all the way back to the beginning of time, there was never a billion people on planet Earth. Did you know that it would take 123 years from 1804 to the year 19, where's it at in my notes? I'll find it. Year 19 something or other. It's not in here. I'm in trouble. I can't do math that fast. It would take 123 years for there to be another billion people added to the world's population. So we have from 1804 all the way back to the beginning of time for us to get to 1 billion people. And from 1804 to 1927, I think I did it. I think. Somebody will come up and correct me afterwards, I'm sure. But from 1804 to 1927, it took to gain to 2 billion. Now, for, listen, for comparison's sake, in 1999, we hit 6 billion people. It would only take 12 years to gain another billion 1999 to 2011, we went from 6 billion to 7 billion people. The world's population has continued to grow, maybe at a little bit of a slower rate moving forward. Analysts project that we will hit 9 billion souls in the year 2042. We hear these numbers and we can't possibly in our minds fathom or, or think about a number that big. It's, it's, it's beyond what we, can even, uh, what we can even contemplate or think about. But did you know that in this world of 7,600,000,000 people, did you know there really are only a couple of kinds of people? And I believe they're found right here in this passage of Scripture. And I also believe they're found right here in this room this morning. You say, well, that's not true. I mean, think about all the people groups and all the languages and all the cultures. I get all of that. But you, but you do understand that in reality, we all share a common thing. We're all human beings. Something terrible unfolded in our world. I think it was this last Friday in a city called Christ Church, New Zealand. And listen, I don't agree with Muslim doctrine. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a Muslim at all. I think that Muslim doctrine is wrong. I believe it's a false doctrine. It's a false gospel. But listen, those people have the right to worship any which way they want to. And God help, God help our world that there be such hatred and that there be such animosity. I want you to know something. Whoever did that, they were not, they were not representative of the God of the gospel. That, that's not the heart that Jesus had. You know, Jesus loved everyone, regardless of the color of skin, regardless of the language that they spoke, regardless of where they came from. Uh, Jesus loves everyone. But in reality, as we look around our world, there really are only three different types of people or three different attitudes that people have towards the Bible, towards the Lord Jesus Christ, towards the true faith. Now, I'm well aware that there are many different religions we've touched on some of them this morning, and they teach many different things. But I want you to also understand that things that are different are not the same, and that there can, there can be this idea when we think about absolute truth, if there's going to be absolute truth, then only one thing can be absolutely true. We, we can't have a, a, a plethora of things that are, that, that, that are directed towards the same thing that may disagree with one another and them all be true. That just, that just makes sense. If you're, a, if you're a mathematician today, you understand as you look at a, at a problem that you must solve, you understand that there can only be one answer. If you're, a, if you're a scientist today and you're trying to, uh, to, to get to a certain point, you realize, well, there, uh, there, there, can only be one, there can only be one fact that is true about this particular thing. And so as we consider the faith today and, and we consider how that meshes with absolute truth, and by the way, as Bible believers, we believe in absolute truth, we understand that things that are different are not the same, that there, there must be truth somewhere. And, and I believe, listen, I believe that it's found right here in this book. I believe it's found in God's Word. It's found in the Bible. But listen, there can only be one Bible. There can only be one authority. There can only be one word that comes from God. 
Now listen, the Bible teaches us that not only is there only one book, there's only one God, but can I also tell you the Bible teaches that there is only one Savior and that his name is Jesus. Do you know that Jesus said during his earthly ministry in John chapter 14 and verse number 6, Jesus looked on his disciples and he said this, I am the way. He did not say, I am a way, or I am one of the ways. He said, I am the way. It's exclusive. He went on to say, I am the truth. Then he said, I am the life. And then he finished that verse and that statement up by saying this, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. That's definitive. That is exclusive. And you may be here today and you may think, I'm a really good person. I, I'm, I'm a profitable member of society. I've been taught something different. Well, listen, somebody is right and somebody is wrong. Because Jesus boldly stood in his earthly ministry and he said, I am the only way. I'm not one way of many. I am the only way. I am the only truth. I am the only light. And if you're going to get to the Father, by the way, where's the Father? He's in heaven. If you're going to get to the Father in heaven, you must come by me. No question about it. That's what he said. The apostle Peter later on uh, would proclaim of Jesus Christ while preaching in Acts chapter number 4 and verse number 12. He would say this, neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. So Peter said, listen, he's the only, he's the only way. There's no salvation in any other. He is the only name that you can find salvation in. The Apostle Paul, he would write this in Romans chapter number 10 and verse number 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So I want you to know something, that this book is a, is a book that has one theme when it comes to salvation, and that theme is Jesus Christ. It's the shed blood of Jesus. It's the fact that you and I are sinners in need of a Savior, and Jesus Christ is that Savior. Now listen, the Scriptures are clear that salvation is exclusively found in the person of Jesus Christ. Do you know that according to Pew Research, and I don't agree with this number, I'm going to give it to you, but I don't agree with it. But according to Pew Research, there are 2.2 billion Christians on the planet today. Again, I think this number is grossly exaggerated. Because this takes every individual that is part of any denomination that we would, we would say is part of Christendom. You say, well, that's being awfully rude to these other denominations. No, 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 it's not being awfully rude. Here, here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that I'm, I'm fairly certain there are people in this room this morning that are lost. So in other words, they're, they're not the only churches that have lost people in them. I guarantee you there are people sitting in this room this morning that if you were to, if you were to die today, if you were to have a heart attack in this service, you, you would not spend eternity with God in heaven. You've never repented of your sin. You've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You say, well, that's, that's rude. That's awful, uh, awful uh, rude of you to say. I, I think it's the best thing that I can say to you. Because I'm telling you, listen, you don't have to stay that way. You can be saved this morning. You don't have to leave this room without a certainty, without an assurance that heaven is your home. We think about this number, though, 2.2 billion Christians. I would say it's probably less than a billion, personally. It might be far less than a billion, but I don't know. Only God knows the heart. But, you know, I, I think to myself, why is it that there are so many who are still lost? Christ has given us 2,000 years as Christians to take the message of the gospel to the world, and we have so poorly underperformed. We, we, as a, we as Christians, we as God's people, we are not doing our job. In fact, it's very possible there are Christians in this room this morning that you can't even remember the last time you shared your faith with someone. You can't remember the last time that you confronted someone about their lost condition, that you told them about Jesus Christ and how he died on the cross to save them. And this is a room filled with Christians. Why is it that we're struggling to get this job done? Did you know that if we as Christians, if we will determine, if we will determine, say, listen, I'm going to give my, the rest of my life to telling people about Jesus. You're going to, as you, as, you, as you go on that journey, on that mission, I believe you're going to encounter several different types of people. I think they're all found in this passage of Scripture. And with the time that we have left, which isn't much, we need to get into it. Number one, I want you to consider the first type of person that's introduced to us in this passage are the enemies of Jesus. We find them in verses 1 to 6. 
They're called Pharisees. And we notice that they have a specific desire in the beginning of this verse. Chapter number one, it says, And he entered again into the synagogues, and there was a man there which had a withered hand. And they watched him whether he would heal him on the Sabbath day, that they might accuse him. I want you to notice the enemies of Jesus have a desire to accuse They have a desire to accuse. They weren't the least bit interested in the plight of this man who was there in the synagogue that day with a withered hand. They didn't follow Jesus to hear what he had to say or to see what he would do. They were there simply waiting to accuse him of some form of wrongdoing. And so they watched very carefully, very closely. And the first moment that he would might make a mistake or might do something contrary to their law, they were ready to pounce. And you know that there are people that come to church and they only come to accuse. They're just, they're just here waiting for the pastor to get his tongue tied. And by the way, every pastor gets his tongue tied. I'm not the only one. I, I know there are others that do so. Might say something that, uh, that, that man, we try to go back, correct the record as quickly as possible. Did you know that there are people in your neighborhood and they're watching you as a Christian? And the only reason they're watching you closely is that they might accuse you of something. Amen. You know, I, I thought you were a Christian. I heard you yelling at your children. Guilty. <laughs> Been there, done that. They're, they're, just, they're just watching that they might have a, a, a reason or a way to accuse. That's, that's it. They're not interested in what we have to say. They're not interested in the truth of the gospel and what the word of God has to say, the truth of the Bible. For these Pharisees in this verse, the, the, the day that they, that they had come into the synagogue was the Sabbath. And and previously they had criticized Christ's followers uh, for plucking corn on the Sabbath day. And now they watched and they waited because here's a man with a withered hand. We're going to see if Jesus does any work on the Sabbath day. And if he does, we stand ready to accuse him because everyone knows it's unlawful to work on the Sabbath. But I want you to notice as far as the enemies of Jesus are concerned, there's a desire to accuse. But notice, secondly, there is an, uh, there's an inability or they're unable to defend their position. Look in verse number three. And he saith unto the man which had the withered hand, stand forth. And he saith unto them, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath days or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they held their peace. Jesus was God. He read their minds. He knew exactly what they were thinking. And he intended to deal with it. It was the elephant in the room. Was the Sabbath to be such an unusual day, he asks, then in essence, uh, a doctor would not aid someone who is dying. Now think about that for a moment. Here's a doctor, and he's, he's given his life to saving people who are sick. He's there in Jewish culture, in Jewish society, and it's Saturday. And, and outside of his home, a, a man is walking, and the man collapses. He is dying would that doctor be so cold and be so heartless as to, as to sit in his home and look out his window as perhaps he's reading his newspaper, eating his meal, and see a man who's collapsed on the road and look at his calendar and realize, well, I would go help him. I could go help him, but it's the Sabbath. I think I'll just stay here in my home. Would, would, a, would a man who is near a body of water look out on that body of water And see a man who is flailing in the water. He's crying out for help. He's drowning. And that man say, I know how to swim. I've been trained to help people who don't know how to swim. Let me see, what day is it? Well, well, it's Saturday. It's the Sabbath. Sorry, buddy, you're out of luck. Who, Who would do such a thing? No one. Jesus is showing them the hypocrisy of their thoughts. Jesus is saying, well, one of you, well, one of you would would allow someone you love who is, who is dealing with problems and issues, what, what would of you would not come to their aid just because it's the Sabbath day? And notice their response. Their response is this, but they held their peace. You know what that means? That just simply means they had nothing to say. They had no way to, to argue with him. He was right. But listen, here's the problem. The problem The problem is, is that when they realized he was right, they held their peace. They didn't say anything in return, but neither did they accept him. They continued to reject him. The writer of Hebrews writes on three separate occasions. You'll find in Hebrews chapter number three and verse eight, 
Hebrews chapter number 3 and verse number 15 and Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 7. Four, three times in those two chapters he says this, Harden not your hearts. Do you know the enemies of Jesus harden their hearts a little more every time they say no to him or reject him? There may be some in this room today and you've come into this room and you have determined in your heart and in your mind, I don't care what he says. I'm just here. I'm here because somebody invited me. I'm here because I'm supposed to be here. And I don't care what he says. I'm not, I'm not making any changes to my life. You know what you're doing? You're hardening your heart. Every time you say no, you harden that heart a little more, a little more. Don't harden your hearts. The Apostle Paul wrote that you not do this. The Bible ch challenges us not to harden our hearts, but that we would say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't be like these men. It's an indefensible choice. I, I can't defend you. I, I can't defend the action to say no to the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice there's a third thing about them. Notice the enemies of Jesus are determined to destroy him. Verse number 6 the Bible says, and the Pharisees went forth and straightway took counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. You know, these men were so desperate to cling to their power. And they saw Jesus making inroads into their, uh, their place of influence. And they were so willing to hold on to this power that they, were, uh, that, that they wanted to destroy him by any means possible. And the Bible gives us a little insight in verse number 6. The Pharisees were not friends with a group of people known as Herodians. You hear that name Herodian, and perhaps you've, you're one step ahead of me. You realize, well, that's the name Herod is in there. And, of course, Herod was a well-known king during the time of Christ. And, and, uh, and, that, and that group of men that were known as King Herod and his sons. And Herodians were a group of Jews that had organized for the purpose of serving Herod the Great. He's known as the great because he was a great architect. His structures are still today in the nation of Israel. You can visit some of those places and see some of the incredible things that he built even in a, in a prehistoric time, uh, the, 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 what he had done. And these Jews, they were prepared to offer homage to Roman power in, in return that they might get political and religious favors. In other words, they said, we're Jews. You represent the Roman government. We, we should be hostile to you. But we understand that you have power, that you have money, that you have wealth and prosperity. And so look, we'll be friendly to you. We'll be on your, on your side if you'll look favorably upon us. And the Pharisees normally would have disdained the Herodians. But in chapter 3 and verse number 6, they hated Jesus so much more that they said, we'll, we'll enter into a partnership with the Herodians just so we can eliminate him. Amen. Someone once said, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And I may not be friends with you. I may not have anything common with you. The only thing that we have in common is the fact that you hate the same person I hate. And that's essentially what's going on here. Amen. Pharisees were not friends with Herodians. Herodians were not friends with Pharisees. They were diametrically opposed to one another, but they both had the same enemy. His name was Jesus. And they were determined to destroy him. We see here the deadly combination of false religion and civil government. And that deadly combination throughout history has attempted, has sought to seek and to destroy Christ and Christianity. But listen, it never will. Jesus himself said the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want you to notice there's a second group of people. We see the enemies of Jesus, but notice the disciples of Jesus. We find them in verse number 7, and then later on we find them in verses 13 to 19. Notice the disciples of Jesus. We find that they were called by him. Look in verse number 13. The Bible says, And he goeth up into a mountain, and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him, and he ordained twelve, that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach. The disciples of Jesus were called by Jesus Christ. Did you know that Jesus is still calling people today? Amen. Did you know that he is, if you're, if you're lost today, he's calling you? That's why you're here. That's why you're here. You may not realize it. You may not have anticipated that this was the work that Christ wanted to do, but if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you're lost. He is speaking to you. He is calling out to you today. Amen. You know what he's telling, you know what he's saying? He, he's saying this. He's saying, I died for you. My blood was shed for you. He's saying this. He's saying, I love you. It may be that there's someone that came in today, you're sitting by yourself. And as you assess your life and your influence, you think to yourself, there aren't very many people that love me, much less someone that would love me enough to die for me. And that may be you this morning. I hope it's not. I hope you have a 
uh, family. I hope you have some friends and people that love you and care about you and be, do, be willing to do just about anything for you. But listen to me. If that's you this morning, can I tell you there is someone who loves you? And he loved you enough to die for you. His name is Jesus. And he's calling you. The Bible says that Jesus called these men. And that, that he, listen, he chose them. He wanted them on his team. We were playing a family game this last week as a family on a, I think it was on a Tuesday night. And we sat down and we're trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to divide into two teams? And somehow, some way, we got some captains together. And, and would you believe I was the first pick in the draft? Oh, that made me feel so good. I, I, I'm telling you, man, I was strutting around my living room. I was the first pick. Somebody wanted me on their team. Guess what? Listen, Jesus wants you on his team. Amen. Jesus chose you. He's calling out to you. He's, he's, he's saying, listen, I want to I form a partnership with you. I want to lead you through this life. He called them. But notice, secondly, he, he sent them. In verses 14 and 15, we find he sent them to do three things. And I, I want you to know something. If you'll respond to the call of Jesus today, if you'll be saved or if you've been saved, say, what can I do for Jesus? I want you to find that there, there's a threefold purpose that Jesus wants you to do with your life. And I want you to see it here. It's found very clearly in this passage of Scripture. And this is for every Christian. This is not just for a select few. This is for everyone. Why did Jesus call his disciples? Notice the first purpose that they were sent by him was to preach to sinners. Amen. Did you see that there in verse number 13? It said this, and he called them, and they came unto him, verse 14, and he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. Can I tell you that preaching, telling other people about Jesus, this is always first and most important in the life of a Christian. Amen. Did you know that this is the most important thing that Jesus, Jesus said his followers can do is to tell other people about me. He said this, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Right. Tell people the good news. Tell them of what I've done, how I've died on the cross. But notice there's a second purpose. Are you, by the way, are you, let me ask this question. Are you preaching to sinners? Are you telling other people about Jesus? If you're not, you are not fulfilling the reason for why Christ saved you. Amen. So that he could send you to do this job. So we need to start doing it. They, they were to preach to sinners, but notice they were to minister to the hurting. They were to minister to the hurting. He says this in verse number 15, and to have power to heal sicknesses. Jesus gave his, unique, his, unique, his disciples unique power to heal the sick and diseased. This power was available during this time period, but, but I don't believe it's available to us today. Now, there'd be people that would argue with me, and, 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 and that's fine. That's their choice to believe this. We base this off of several things. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, speaking of, of, the, of the gifts, of the sign gifts, whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. You say, well, prove to me that the sign gifts cease, that, 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 that people can no longer heal. Well, let's think about it like this. In Acts chapter, I believe it's Acts chapter number 20, the Apostle Paul raised a man from the dead. His name was Eutychus. You remember that story, don't you? He preached so long, he was sitting in a window in a third floor of a home, and he fell out of the window. I, I take great comfort in that story because I'm not the only preacher to put somebody to sleep. The Apostle Paul put somebody to sleep. I've got people who come to me, and they'll tell me, you know, I, I tried. I, was really, I tried really hard today. Well, thanks for your encouragement. I appreciate it. God bless you. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> Apostle Paul put a, put a man to sleep while he was preaching. He fell out of the window. Paul went down to the, where he was on the ground, and he, and, he, and he raised him from the dead, the Bible says. But did you know that later in Paul's ministry, he did not heal Epaphroditus in Philippians chapter 2? He did not heal a man by the name of Trophimus in 2 Timothy chapter 4? Amen. Did you know that when he was writing to Timothy, Timothy was having some stomach problems, and Paul was unable to heal him? He told him, he said, here's a good remedy that you can consider, but he did not heal him in 1 Timothy chapter 5. Did you know that Paul didn't even have the ability to heal himself in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12? When he said, I've got a thorn in the flesh, and I've gone to God three separate times that he would remove it from me, and God has not done so. Wow. We even see in Paul's life towards the end of the first century that the, the ability to heal was starting to be done away with. But listen, you and I may not have the ability to heal someone, but here's what we do have. We still have the ability to minister to hurting people, Amen. to love them. We can still pray for them. We can still do what we can for them. I may not be able to speak in tongues or heal someone, 
Well, the Bible tells us in the end of 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, now abideth these three, faith, hope, and charity. And the greatest of these is charity. Amen. The greatest of these is taking my heart of compassion, extending it to someone else. So we see here that they were told to minister the hurting. And then notice thirdly, they were told to confront the devil. I don't have time to spend much time here. But we see that they were given power to cast demons and devils out of people who were demonically possessed. They were filled with demons. And uh, we, we find here that God has always had power over Satan. Satan is powerful. Don't misunderstand me. But God is more powerful. And so you, listen, as Christians, as believers, we've been sent to preach to sinners. We've been sent to minister to hurting people. And we have been sent to confront the devil. Amen. That's what we're sent to do. Are we doing it? And then I want you to notice about the disciples of Jesus. They were known by him in verses 16 and 19. Again, we're, we're out of time, but we'll notice you'll find that he lists all of their names. He had relationships with them. He knew some would be very well known. Peter, James, and John, they'd be very well known. He knew that one would be really well known for the wrong thing. His name was Judas. He's listed at the very end of this rundown in verse number 17, or excuse me, verse number 19. He, he knew them. He was a vital part of his life. He knew his disciples. He knew those that were disciples. A disciple is what? It's a learner. It's one who receives or professes to receive instruction from another. It's a follower, an adherent to the doctrines of another. Are you a disciple of Christ today? You say, I'm saved. Does it make you a disciple? Are you really a follower? Are you really a learner? Not just hearing what he has to say, but doing it? The third type of person we must finish is the multitudes we find. Number three, the multitudes that follow Jesus. In verses 7 to 12, we're introduced to them. We just have time to hit on them. Notice they traveled a great distance to see him. Look in verse number 7. But Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples to see. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea and from Jerusalem and from, and from, and from all of these different places. These individuals came a long way to see him in action. He was famous. His popularity was spreading. In a short amount of time, he had become a superstar in the world. And they were there. They were there to see what he would do. His fame had spread rapidly, and these people had spared no expense that they might get to where he was. They traveled a great distance to see him. But notice, secondly, they came, listen, not to hear what he would say, but to see what he would do. Remember Jesus said, Jesus said, listen, what's to be preeminent is preaching. But listen, they didn't come to listen to his message. They came because they'd heard, he can heal my loved one. He can heal me. They weren't there to listen to what he had to say. They were there to see what he might do. They weren't there. They weren't interested to hear what he had to say about the kingdom of God, about the law, about Moses and the prophets, or any such thing. All they were interested in was watching him giving blind people sight, watching him taking a deaf ear and opening it so people suddenly could hear for the very first time. Oh, they were interested to see him take a man who was lame and had been lame since birth and to watch him stand up and run uh, down the street. That's what they were there to see. They were uninterested in what he had to say. And I want you to notice thirdly that when the show ended, they ceased from following him. As we close in John chapter number 6, Jesus looked at his followers. Many had gone away, the Bible says. In verses 66 and 67, he asked this question, Will ye also go away? There are people in church this morning, not because they want to be here, because they're a disciple of Christ, because somebody brought them, because they have to be here. Their parents expect them to be in church. Their wife expects them to be here. Maybe they're here to be seen of men. Maybe they're here because they heard we have beautiful music here or that this is a friendly congregation. And you didn't come to listen to the message. You didn't come to hear what Jesus Christ has to say to you. No, you're here for another reason whatever reason that may be. And when, when everything concludes and we had our separate ways, you walk away unchanged. And the vast majority of this multitude would walk away from Jesus. When it came right down to it, at the end of his life, Jesus would have approximately 120 followers. That was it. Where, where did all the multitudes go? Where did all the people go? Well, because there are basically three types of people in this world. They're the enemies of Jesus who stand in defiance to him no matter what he says. They're the disciples of Jesus, those who have bought in and believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the only Savior. And then there's the multitudes who might drop in for a service or two. They might, they might even come for a while, but they're only here because what, what can this preacher say to me that will make me feel better about myself? 
I want to hear some beautiful music. I want to be seen of men. And then they're gone. Will ye also go away?